Muslim women have been standing up to these extremist organizations from California to Washington DC to New York. Our organization took on Osama bin Laden, the Taliban, and saying, what happened to our country, the country that has given us all refuge. And today I can be here sitting with the greatest leaders of the, the uh, women's rights. And we are saying, yeah, that was good. That was, you know, the Jewish people were not there on 9-11. They must have done it. And then you all remember that San Bernardino, we've been working on countering violent extremism. San Bernardino, it was a Muslim guy. The lady who organized it was one of our members. And she said, he came in and he said, where are the Jews, where are the Christians? And he killed them. And then, care, Muslim Brotherhood in America, in California, sends out videos saying, oh, we saw three white Jewish men. They committed this. The Jews want the Muslims to look bad. That is not true. And so we stood up to them. What did they do? Like um, Ms. Khan said, they silence us, much like they silence Hamas, uh, uh, people in Gaza and Palestine. Yes, I have been there. I've spoken to the leaders who lost to Hamas in 2007, and they told us the same thing. But I want you to think, this is America. This is not Gaza. This is not Ramallah. This is not Janine. Why are we being silenced here? Who's bullying us? I'll tell you who's bullying us and who has brainwashed our young people on campuses. Today, I'm here, yes, I'm here for my Israeli sisters. But I'm also here for my three-year-old granddaughter, Nora, who is going to go to school here and who is going to grow up hating Jewish people and thinking every possible crime has been committed by them. That is not okay with me. And it should not be okay with anybody else because let me tell you, Islamophobic incidents have started going on the rise because people are asking, what does Islam teach you to kill people? Because remember, the Miami Dade shooting was committed by a Muslim. So how can CARE slash Muslim Brotherhood stand with the Jewish, with the LGBT community and say, where's for Palestine? They hate them. They will lynch them. And when they turn around, these men who are in the mosque of America, and they don't allow women like me to speak there. Why? Because I like Israel, I like Jewish people, like my prophet of Islam, peace be upon him. When he took refuge, first he sent his people to the Christians, because they are in the kitab. Then he sent them for refuge and went himself to Medina, where the Jewish tribes were. So don't you ever tell me that these people are not our people and that we must kill them. This is the kind of rhetoric that we have been hearing in California for 20 years. The campuses in California are funded, the MSAs are funded by CARE, and you guys have to also pick and choose who you're advocating with. Because for 20 years, me and my Muslim sisters, 20 of them have been harassed by the Muslim Brotherhood patriarchy that is in all these organizations. Let me tell you what one of the leaders of the Muslim organization called Muslim Public Affairs Council told me eight years ago. Imagine eight years ago, and you'll know where the anti-Semitism is coming from. When I was going to meet with a Jewish leader, I stood up against Irvine 11, those kids that had gone berserk, and um, Ambassador Oren wanted to meet me. This leader came to me, he's an Arab, Salam al and he said, oh sister, don't go to the Jewish people, they can't be our friends, and you can't trust them, they'll use your pictures. I thought about my father who had built Pakistan and my grandmother and they, when I moved here, told me Muslims thrive with Jews. We are people of the book. When we live with them and we work with them, communities thrive. And I knew that that could not be the teaching of Islam and that these people have a separate agenda. So all this going on about anti-Semitism, is anti-Israel is not anti-Semitism? Let me tell you it is. Because Salam al mariyami told me that, you know what, Israel? Israel is evil. They are killing the Palestinians 10, 15 years ago. And I said, no, 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 I can't work with men like that. Anyway, these men don't even think that we are a human being. They tell us we should sit in the kitchen, we can't have a seat at the table, that we don't have a brain. I'm not going to work with them. We founded American Muslim women. And the other six
to the right leader, then we all have a high opinion. Let me tell you about that gentleman because he has harassed, discriminated, abused, almost killed one of my sisters that I've been supporting for the past five years. Lori Saroya, please Google her. Look at the stories of women and know what happened to them. This civil rights leader allegedly asked for a sexual favor and his, his name is Nihadawa. Who is he? He's the head of care in America. For God's sake, we want these men to be held accountable. We want to stop the funding of MSAs. I met with the Jewish organizations who were so worried about young Muslim students in medical colleges that are coming and telling them, we don't want to hear about your, your Holocaust because that offends us. Imam, two Imams that are our allies and went to March of Israel, March of um, Living with us. 50 Muslims went to March of Living with us. They stood at Auschwitz and they prayed. They are with you and they are here to break this patriarchy with the Muslim sisters. But we need you guys to know what's happening. Thank you so much. <laughs> the impact that nobody seems to be talking about is something that I want to talk to you about, Carolyn, Dr. Helmer. You know, you have specialized in really looking into the impact of trauma, and especially you deal with survivors. But my question to you is, yes, what is the impact on the individual who's been traumatized and violated like that? But what is the impact on the family? And what is the impact on the community? And then, what is the impact on the entire world? Thank you so much for making this happen. I mean, it's just incredible that we're having this conversation and that this film is getting airtime. I mean, we really owe you for that. Um, I just want everyone to just, with me for a moment, just take a nice deep breath. Just breathe in and breathe out. And I know that's a hippy-dippy thing to do, but we've actually all experienced that, at least a minor trauma this evening, or, or tertiary trauma as we call it, because we have witnessed, we have borne witness, not to the explicit images, but, but to the testimonies of what happened on October 7th. And I just want to lay out some stats. Uh, working with survivors, this is a particularly egregious um, instance or, or series of acts of violence. Um, Violence or rape as a tool of war started in the late Middle Ages when, uh, when rape was considered a way to show your manhood. It was considered a common or normal part of the spoils of war. And since that time, literally millions of women have been raped, mostly women, some men. Uh, we had a commission after World War II document, documenting that, the rape of Manjing. Uh, World War II, uh, you name it, uh, in, in uh, the former Yugoslavia. Uh, as you noted, Heidi, it is happening right now. It is happening in Ukraine. It is happening in Haiti. And we're talking about organized, systemic use of rape as a tool of uh, sexual violence, as a tool of war. And the rapes that happen uh, on women on October 7th were a war against their body. And, 96% uh, of rape survivors will suffer post-traumatic stress disorder within the first two weeks. 51% will have lifelong post-traumatic stress disorder. So we actually do understand that the trauma that happens with rape. We understand because we understand PTSD of veterans coming back from war. We understand the flashbacks, the sleeplessness. You're going to have issues sleeping tonight because of, of your tertiary trauma from, from bearing witness to this, right? Many of you are. Um, we're talking about depression. We know that um, rates of depression for trauma for those who've experienced rape and sexual assault are three times what they are for folks who have not. We know that uh, suicidal ideation and death by suicide is over two times more common for rape survivors. And so what is happening with these families right now is their entire, that the survivor's identity has been shaken, that the family's identity has been shaken, their community's identity has been shaken, mostly because of a myth that drives victim blaming. And that myth is, and, and this is why we, even, even 
though we know better, many of us uh, do not believe survivors or want to blame them or hold them somehow accountable. What was she wearing? What was she doing? What was she, you know, why was she out at night? We, we tell this story because to tell the truth, which is that we don't control these acts of criminal violence, right? And that the survivor is not at all responsible for a criminal felonious act against her. If, if we tell that truth, then it means we can't control it. It means that our daughters are on college campuses where they find, face higher rates of rape and sexual assault than if they don't go to college. It means that we are not in control 